Hi. Uh, my name is Kashif. Uh, I'm an engineer working at Facebook. Uh, and I'm seriously jet lagged, so I might just fall asleep. Right? <laughs> um, anyway, so today me and Emily are going to talk about um, Open Cellular, uh, which actually been announced that it's going to be released, but you will see like there are some files which is just hanging around uh, on, the, on our tip website. So I will talk more about that. All right, so main question is, um, as uh, Alexander and... Um, Harold mentioned there are many, many base stations out there that are actually designed to work uh, for 2G, 3G, 4G, and so on. Uh, so then the question is, why build another base station, right? And um, and the main reason is uh, when we actually did our analysis at, at Facebook, uh, we find out that most of the... Uh, of the ruler communities is actually uh, very small uh, and they're very isolated. So you will go to these ruler areas, see like a pocket of, of people, like maybe a kilometer and then nothing and kilometer and nothing and so on and on and on. And it just repeat and repeat and repeat. The second thing is um, based on our study is the direct cost of a base station is uh, just a fractional of the overall cell side cost, right? So when I say cell side, in, it includes the base station include, of course, this is ruler side, so I'm assuming it's running on solar. It includes the panel cost, includes the battery cost, charge controller, the tower, land acquisition. Most of these places overshadow all the electronics. Your security, like your fences, if it's like in a highly, you know, uh, uh, not, not, not too stable areas and so forth. And then it's also about the operational and management. So one of these sites goes down, let's say for whatever reason, you have to send someone, it costs like hundreds of dollars. And with those hundreds of dollars, your your ROI just off the chart. So we're talking that one particular site. That was the second reason. So we were looking into how we can reduce the overall site cost, not just the base station cost. And the third thing was, uh, most importantly for us, was the open source hardware. Uh, so as Alexander mentioned, like their UMTRX is open, uh, but we wanted everything to be open. We're talking like mechanicals, industrial designs, plastic, whatever. Uh, we're talking amplifiers, I will show in a minute. Uh, we're talking motherboards, microcontrollers, every single thing. And we wanted to build and use open source software. Um, so these are the main three reasons that we started this project. So this is the overall architecture uh, of uh, Open Cellular, the current version. There is a lot of, lot of room for improvement. Uh, so this is not the final version. And the whole idea is we build something we want to be open so other people can start contributing and hopefully make it better. Um, so overall, we have three ma major component, and I will go more into detail. Uh, the first one we call the GBC. Uh, there was a mistake here, but it just stick with B. It's supposed to be P. Uh, so the GBC is your general baseband processor or application processor. Basically, here is running Intel um, Patrol. Uh, uh, on the GBC board, which is a, a board itself, uh, has also an embedded controller, which is based on ARM M4. Uh, and it has all the power circuitry is all here. Then the second one is the SDR, or is highlighted red because the current version is the SDR, but we have worked on many multiple SOC versions too. Uh, so the SDR is basically a derivation of um, the Atos uh, B200 or B210. Um, and on the SOC version, we have uh, played with Intel and most recently Kevium. Um, on the TRX side uh, is right now, since based on, based on um, B, uh, B200, uh, is basically ADI chip. Uh, so it can go up to six gigahertz. And the whole idea was Oh, sorry. Awesome. Uh, and the whole idea of uh, of splitting that uh, was we wanted frequency independent part to be on the SDR and frequency dependent part to be on the front end. And that's what we build the front end. So this is a very specific, uh, um, that particular carrier base, whatever, like let's say 2G, then it will support like 900 megahertz, 850, 1800, 1900, and so on. One watt, two watt, and so forth. Uh, this is the analog front end. So... Let's go a little bit more into detail. Um, this is basically, uh, you've seen the picture of the, the box, we're supposed to bring it, but anyway. Um, uh, is 
is the same thing. The GBC radio, the front end, three main components, and then we have uh, other sporting components around it. So, for example, we have a sync board, uh, and Alex was mentioning the same uh, problem we have uh, with existing SDR is the clock. Uh, so you need that 0.1 uh, uh, or 0 0.05 whatever ppm. So we are using, for example, a GPS DO. Uh, it's a part from Jackson Lab, uh, readily available. Uh, it uses the GPS to, to sync his clock to the PLL and so on. Also on the sync board is something, uh, going back to the idea that I mentioned earlier, is like if one of these sites goes down, then it costs like hundreds of dollars. You have to send engineers and so forth. So we have built, um, well, use uh, auto band control channel. This is used basically a radium satellite module that, that just goes on it and is completely optional. So it's a connector that you can populate or you cannot populate. It all depends on you. Um, and the whole idea is this is something we actually uh, learned by our experience is one of our, our site was in a very remote area and somehow the power got disconnected. And because the power got disconnected, of course, everything is, is dead. We have no idea what happened. Someone stole the base station, it fall off the tree and so on. So we have to send someone like go check it out and it costs a lot of money and, and time and frustration. And I will show you like how we solve that back of power problem. So that's on the sync module. That's uh, again using Iridium. Uh, we have built auxiliary uh, boards around it basically to, for example, you want to debug, you want to like um, um, uh, flash like some uh, on, on the flash ROM, on the microcontrollers and so on. So that's a debug board that will go in the GBC. Uh, that debug basically have all your interfaces, HDMI, uh, Ethernet, USB. Um, I think this is a typo. It should be ICDI, in circuit debugger interface, but anyway. Uh, now, digging more on the GBC, um, again, uh, so we have the computing board, which is, as I said earlier, is Intel uh, 3, forgot, 3845, it's a quad core. Uh, and we also have an Ethernet switch, it's a 100 MB uh, Ethernet switch, and it has a microcontroller and so forth. On the radio side, so the current radio, uh, as I said, is a derivative of, um, I think I will, I will talk to you in a, in, in a minute, it's a derivative of USB, but we have actually added some other interface. So there is a PCIe line going to the Atom, but it's not currently used because we don't have software for it. Um, and, and so forth. So on the front end, we have, as I said, like, so all the PLA, uh, PAs, LNA, and Emily will, will touch upon that in a minute, uh, is all the filtering, duplexers, couplers, and another interesting thing we added was the GSM loopback. So, which is basically a small GSM module that's sitting on the front end, and it does a loopback, so we can actually, when we upload the patch, we can test the whole thing, if everything is working fine or not. Uh, these are the basic interfaces, and and I will uh, and the reason why they're very important because as I said earlier, um, here we have the SDR and the SOC version. Uh, basically, the whole system is designed that you can take the SDR card and put the new SOC card in. Uh, current version that we're working on with Kevium is basically the LTE version. So you take the our SDR card and input the LTE card. Now it becomes a LTE uh, like a micro base station, not, not small cell. Uh, the, the, all these basic senders are very well defined. Is nothing new. Uh, it's just USB, GPIOs to control various uh, various switches, powers, and so forth. There's an I2C line that goes uh, to control various sensors that we have. It 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 has the current sensor, voltage sensor, temperature sensors. So it does the power cycling and so forth. And it has 12 volt. Uh, it takes the PoE, uh, which I will actually talk in a minute. Uh, it takes the PoE and it takes various power source and convert that into 12 volts. So internally it's 12 volt. We also use 5 volt, uh, which is for front end because the PA we're using right now is uses 5 volt. And yep. Yeah, so, all right, cool. Uh, going a little bit more. Uh, so I'm going to start with the standard like interfaces that we have into the box. Um, as I said, so this is PoE. Uh, it takes uh, PO, it has two PoE port. One is the PD and the other is the PSC. Uh, this is actually uh, PoE++ from linear technology, so it can go up to 90 watts. Uh, I mean, it's not going to go up to 90 watts, but it can. Uh, it also supports the passive PoE and is backward compatible with the standard uh, AT and AF. 
the idea of the second port on the PSC was right now it can only do maximum of 20 watt output uh, and the reason is because we thought this is good enough so you can attach a ubiquity uh, like a nano station and do a, like a long distance Wi-Fi and hook up another base station to it so you don't have to run another wire uh, up the pole. Uh, on the DC input, it takes 16 to 24 as a DC input and can go up to 32, 36. Uh, as a, this, is, this is basically overloaded, you can actually attach a solar directly to this base station because what it has is it has a built-in uh, uh, the charge controller. So, and going back to what I was telling earlier, uh, we have built in uh, two charge controller. One is for sealed acid battery, which is external to the base station. And the other is the lithium ion battery, which is internal to the base station. So this lithium ion battery stays inside the base station and it gives you the power bridging. So for example, if your main power goes down, you will always be in a known state. And if your backhaul goes down, then it uses the, the iridium module to ping that what really happened. And then it can use that to state or kick off some, some whatever your, your backup system is. So it has a built-in UPS. And depending on the power source, which is right now is hard-coded, uh, so it is a very, very hard-coded sequence on the power. So for example, when your DC, when your PE is there and the lithium ion is there, the PoE take precedence and the PoE is not there, DC is there, DC take precedence and so forth. So right now it's hard-coded. Uh, so yeah, so so the battery backup system can last uh, for this version, can last up anywhere between 25 to 35 minutes, depending on uh, how, uh, how you're running your PAs. If you're running at full power, which is right now is two watt per TRX, it will last about 25 minutes uh, on, on the battery, uh, on the lithium ion. Right, um, going forward, uh, oh yeah, uh, well, the basic stuff, it has uh, two N type because we have two TRX. Uh, again, this is something just uh, ADI chip support and then it has a power switch. Uh, on the Ethernet, uh, sorry, on the microcontroller, the housekeeping part, uh, as I said, is, is basically based on the TI ARM uh, M4, the Tiva microcontroller. This the right now we it, it uses 120 mega megahertz microcontroller. We don't really sure if we need it that much, but we just add it so we can provision it with the swap out the part with a smaller one as needed. Uh, this microcontroller it manages all the power rails. So for example, this is the last man standing. So this this particular piece is rated to last up to uh, ambient of 125 Celsius, which hopefully will never happen. Uh, but the whole rail, the whole power supply for this is independent of the power supply for the rest of the system. So this always gets up and then it will enable the rest of the, powers, uh, the power uh, rails one by one. And if something bad, like for example, for whatever reason, like let's say it's 55 ambient outside and internally it just happened to be too hot, all these are uh, industry rated uh, temperatures, so it can last up to 85, but you don't want to run them at 85, so you wanna run them lower. So based on the policy, you can shut things down and so forth, or never start up. Uh, it also monitored the Ethernet switch that I was telling earlier. These are the switch, those two, uh, uh, the PoE ports so goes to the Ethernet switch. Uh, this particular part has a uh, built-in MDI, so it has it, that also goes to the Ethernet switch. So you can actually ping the the, the platform uh, uh, even when your Intel is not running. Um, so you can actually ping and, and get the status of what's going on. You can enable, disable, or you can send the ping on the on the uh, on the radium module and so forth. Um, uh, yeah, so monitor the boot sequence. It runs our uh, uh, version called OCVR. Just talk in a minute, which is basically a real-time OS based of DI Autos, which was originally called SysBIOS and so forth. All right, so this is the host processor. This is this is one board. This is the GBC board. This is the basically what I was telling earlier. This is Intel three eight eight four five, and all these goes back to that connector where the, your uh, SDR or your radio card connects. Okay, uh, so, so this is a radio card and I said like, these are just uh, standard interfaces, uh, uh, USB 2, USB 3, I2C, most important like the, there's a PCIe 12 volt and 3.3. This is the 3.3 volt that is actually on Tiva. So it's completely independent. So even if you are not uh, powering up your SDR, you can still ping various uh, components, for example, EPP-ROM to get the ID and so forth. Um, 
and the rest is basically a standard SDR, so there's nothing really here. Uh, the difference between uh, B210 uh, or yeah, B210, and this one is uh, B210 uses, uh, I believe, Spartan 6. Uh, we use Arctic 7. The PIM maps are changed. Uh, the clocks are changed. Uh, we use a little bit different uh, PLL circuitry, but otherwise, conceptually, is the same. That's why it's backward compatible with uh, UHD. Um, Right, um, and I think Emily will talk about this. This is the this is the the front end uh, one of the RF chain that we have implemented, uh, and then it just replicated on the other uh, as a, as a second TRX. And uh, she will walk through. So I'm going to skip that. Uh, this is a very, very high level uh, architecture for the software, what we have right now. Uh, so we started with the core boot. Uh, so we have uh, basically taking a Minow board uh, core boot and and change it to work with our uh, motherboard or the GBC. Uh, right now, uh, all the code is not been pushed into mainline core boot yet. Uh, this is still like uh, internal to Facebook because we're still finishing a bunch of testing on this. But all of this will go back to mainline, so we don't plan to fork or any such thing. It doesn't make sense. Um, on the core boot part, then, is a traditional, uh, the BIOS, which is basically C BIOS, not U boot yet. Again, just to, just to make things easier. And then on top of it, it runs Linux. Uh, we have done some enhancement on the bo bootloader uh, around core boot, which is basically uh, because, uh, you could just go back. Uh, one thing here is, um, uh, yeah, uh, so this guy, uh, the microcontroller, is actually monitoring the boot sequence. Uh, so as um, as the Intel boots up, it goes uh, initialize silicon, then initializes ROM, then initializes RAM, blah blah blah. It goes through all the step. So all that all that is actually monitored by uh, by that the the Tiva. Uh, oh, sorry, the microcontroller, which is the OC weird part. So it monitor and let's let's assume uh, your MSRI is not working. It will restart, 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 three three retry. It doesn't work. Is going to say, hey, what the hell, something happened. It will start sending messages out on the Ethernet port or Iridium, depends on how you have configured it. On top of it, of course, the UHD drivers, that uh, very, very minor modification because the part is different. So from, instead of Spartan 6, is Arctic 7, so you have to recompile. The pin mapping is different. The clock is a little bit different because you use 40 megahertz internally and so forth. So very small changes, not much, but we hope to put it back. And then on top, it runs uh, just a regular Linux on that uh, Intel side. Uh, and then on the OCware, which is basically, as I said earlier, uh, and I will talk about this here, uh, is uh, uh, TivaWare uh, from TI, which is open source. We uh, we can run on free RTOS uh, because the free RTOS, there's a port to run on the Tiva microcontroller, but we have not played with that. But then again, the TivaWare is open source. Anyone can download. It's a free license, uh, free software. Um, and these are all the subsystems that run internally. Uh, one other thing I want to discuss here is the BMS, the battery management system, which is what I was telling earlier. It has two charge controllers, so this is all uh, handled by, by this microcontroller. And again, and so forth. So, and it goes on, and UART, you can support UART, Ethernet, OBC is the out of band control data channel, which is that Iridium module. So, you can actually ping it from various sources on Ethernet, on UART, because UART is actually connected to the Atom. And you can ping from Atom, you can ping on the Ethernet port, or you can ping on the, on the out of band control channel. So, going back here, uh, so, so all the stuff that you see on the right side, the OCware, OC middleware, OCCLI APIs, and all the stuff. The software we're still working on, so it's not open yet, uh, but it will be available for everyone. And we do plan to put on the public GitHub, so it won't be just behind anything. And then on top of it, of course, Linux, then we, we run Osmo. Uh, one other thing is this is, since uh, it's a variation of uh, B200, it, it's, it runs open, uh, uh, Osmo TRX. And, yep. Yeah. And then on top of it, for the management uh, part, the provisioning of the base stations and everything, it runs the community seller management that Umar is going to discuss that. That's already open. Uh, it's on the, on the fabricator uh, on the sorry, GitHub. Yeah. GitHub, uh, so you can have a look at it. All right, cool. Um, yes. So now Emily is going to talk about exciting stuff. <laughs> Thanks. Cool, yeah. Um, so, um, 
Just kind of transitioning. Um, so uh, the SDR, uh, the software running on here, is um, we have the, the FX3 firmware, uh, which communicates to the FPGA. Um, currently, the FPGA is uh, really just running the UHD, but uh, we've provisioned the FPGA uh, such that it could do TRX control um, and uh, gain control of, of the front end components, which is mostly what I'll talk about. Um, and there's also uh, OCWare running on the front end to configure state like uh, the PA gain stages um, and some other components that you'll see soon. And maybe just one point to bring up, um, uh, as Kashif mentioned, so um, you may notice like there's kind of like these two separate verticals here. So there's like the UHD um, driver, which will uh, control the uh, gain stages in the ADI chip. Um, and then there is the, the OCWare, which will control the gain stages on the uh, front end. And then there's this kind of like a, a, a higher layer that ties it all together. So now looking more at, um, cool, at the front end. Um, and how are we for time? I think we're a bit over. A bit over. <laughs> so, so I don't have to go into too much detail here. Um, I think like the main point I want to make is that um, we have um, uh, separated, uh, we, have, we have three boards as Kashif mentioned. So we have uh, the general compute board and then we have the SDR board uh, derivative of the B210 and then we have a separate front end. And as Kashif mentioned, um, the uh, the reason why we made that division is so um, uh, this, this front end which is inherently ossified, it is static, it has these filters that are not polyphase, they're not going to be changing anytime soon. So that sort of stuff is very specific to say the operator or uh, the region you're in um, can be easily swapped out. But the things that will not change is is this frequency agile portion, the portion that works from you know DC to 6 gigahertz, which is part of the SDR board. So. Um, currently, the front end that we're supporting is actually just uh, presently a 900 megahertz uh, board, um, and it has, you know, it comes with its own particular power levels, noise figure, um, signal flows, which uh, which can be tuned to your specific scenario by just building another uh, uh, um, front end board. Um, so. So that's what I'll be talking about here. So just really quickly. So that's kind of where the line's drawn. So this is like maybe, this is transmit and receive of one TRX, transmit and receive of the other TRX, and all this is just control. Um, so I think I'll just kind of, oh, I guess I should show that. So, um, so you know, the, the ADI chip uh, puts out nominally zero dBm. We have some gain stages. Uh, then you know we have some passive components that introduce some loss. Um, and we have a we have a switch here. And what this switch does is it um, can send the signal back to uh, this G GSM module. So we have a little GSM receiver inside of our GSM. Oh, sorry, we have a little we have a GSM transceiver for a mobile station inside of our GSM transceiver, which is a BTS. So if you want to, you know, as Kasha said, make sure that your update worked or whatever, you can just uh, send the signal directly to this little UE, this little mobile station right here. But normally it'll be going straight ahead, zooming along um, through some filtering and gain stages through our PA um, to 20 dB coupler, which is going to... Um, uh, always be in the line. Um, it just uh, siphons off some of the signal for forward and reverse power detection for uh, visoir measurement. Uh, then we have an onboard ceramic duplexer, which, as you can see, sucks away half the signal. Um, 3 dB loss right there, going to the RX chain. Um, and you know, if you give this thing a, what is that, a 14 dBi antenna, you will have a 47 dBm out. Um, so quickly making a U-turn. Um, so. What I'm going to do here, it's a little, this is a little esoteric, but um, I'll just go through this. Oh, no. Back. Um, all right. um, so I'm just kind of like tracing through here um, the noise figure. Um, and maybe just quickly like uh, discuss the importance of the noise figure um, related back to what Alexander was talking about and Harold was talking about. You know, if this axis is your, um, your receive sensitivity, and let's say this is negative 102 dBm, negative 102 dBm. 
you know, and, and ideally, you know, you're down here at negative like 108 dBm, and then you can receive even more signals. You can, your cell size becomes larger, but practically um, the received sensitivity is, is often closer to negative uh, 101 dB, 102 dBm. Um, and that's because um, of, of this, this noise figure. So you can, um, basically, when you, when you add gain stages, like this in white is all these gain stages, you're not only increasing your signal, but you're increasing your noise. And um, each time you do that, uh, you're, uh, you're basically, uh, each time your noise figure goes up, you're reducing your sensitivity. So the way that you get to your received sensitivity is you, uh, you calculate the thermal noise floor, which is a function of your bandwidth, because it's just white noise integrated over a uh, channel band, um, channel bandwidth. And then you add to that. So let's say in the case of GSM, that's actually close to a ne negative 120 dBm. So it's way down here. And then you add to that your noise figure. So let's say that's often around like a 5 dB. So then you're at negative 115, but maybe actually it's more like 10 dB <laughs> on the band edges particularly. So you're more like at negative 110 dBm received sensitivity. And then uh, that's great. Maybe you could receive, uh, I mean, you, you, what you still need to do is be able to decode a signal. So in order to decode a signal, you need to have a signal to noise ratio that, uh, that will enable the receiver to tell the difference between like a one, like a one over here and a zero over here. Well, like if this zero is getting really close to this one, you know, it, it, that's insufficient SNR to tell, to tell if it's a zero or one. So then you add maybe like 5, 6 dB SNR for GMSK, and you get closer to a negative 102 dBm. So uh, that's, that's what this number here is tra tracking. And that's why it's also really important to uh, put your first gain stage as close as possible to the antenna. Because you notice any passive element, like the duplexer or the, uh, or the um, cable or whatever. So here, actually. Previously, I showed the duplex. It was three dB. I guess it was actually two dB. So this is so this is its um, this is its uh, insertion loss. If we assume that we have a zero a zero dB signal, so it's all relative to what's received at the antenna. So dB is a relative measurement. So we have zero dB at the antenna. So then we have uh, this uh, two dB down, two point one dB down, is basically creating a noise figure of two point one. So this first thing is introducing two dB. Of, 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 of noise figure. But if you notice through all these things, even like a digital attenuator, which could in introduce a lot of loss, the noise figure is hardly going up. And that's because we have an early gain stage right here. So this low noise amplifier um, basically normalizes uh, the, the later, um, the later uh, noise figure insertion losses to relative to this gain stage, which is very high. You know, it's like 20 dB. Um, so that brings me to the end. Um, so yeah. So basically, um, where where the line is drawn is actually here. So if you want to um, not use these components, do something different. You know, you, you stick with this uh, SDR board and just introduce your own uh, front end. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this presentation about the Open Zelda project, um, and thank you. Um, despite being late, uh, I still think questions, one or two? Yeah, back there, Peter. Hey, thanks. Um, how much approximately do you feel like this will save on an installation cost? Not in terms of percentage, but an actual dollars approximately yeah so um, I want to give a number I was prior told us not to give any number but uh, compared to traditional one is uh, traditional as in I don't know it's, I cannot really say it's, it could be it's less than 10,000 a site that includes everything That's 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 the end. Yep. Any more questions?
Welcome back, Niels. Uh, I found it interesting that uh, you're from Facebook and on the other slide you had the big brother. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just curious, what is the big brother doing there? Uh, I was just, just getting you guys, yeah, we, we actually got that as a joke in there, big brother. <laughs> okay, yeah, I noticed it immediately, of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, one last question, a real question. <laughs> You spoke about um, RF power measurements uh, in, in the microcontroller part and um, that it's somehow connected uh, over this middleware uh, in, in one of the earlier slides uh, back to the, I say, yeah, well, to the Osmo stuff. Um, do you have some improvements made in the UMTX uh, world when it comes to power loops, uh, Osmo uh, Osmo power loops? Um. So, so the the how loud is my BSS is send MBTS sending and what is is it telling the mobile station how loud it should be? So uh, just just a, a quick correction that'll be um, more relevant when well Omar speaks, but maybe it actually won't touch on this. So there there it actually doesn't loop back um, the 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 control that happens in the front end and the Osmo stack are at this time independent. And there'll be like this layer on top that uh, that kind of um, manages how, how how the two come together. Um, but I I mean I think in terms of like power saving, do you want to speak to that, Kashif? Is is that the question? No, no, not about power saving, uh -huh. but uh, about the p regulation, uh, how loud the base station is transmitting, uh, that I said statically as an mm. operator, uh, but uh, how loud the mobile station is transmitting, right. that's something which should be loop controlled by um, the whole right. stack. Right. And I, I know we have some issues there, we need yeah. to have improve that and... Uh, my interest in is, uh, right. have you already done that or are you planning to? So we have provisioned the hardware to be capable of doing that, to be capable of adding like automatic gain control stages and um, in, in both RX and TX, but we have not yet implemented that. We're using just the traditional UHD driver at this time. And those types of things, you would want to implement that in the FPGA, which is right there, like right where the action is, as opposed to in our our microcontroller, which, which would be really too slow to have anything more than an impact of like, you know, drift. Um, uh, more s slow, s long term effects. Okay, yeah, as I said, we are behind schedule by uh, 15 minutes already, so I'd like to uh, move towards the next presentation. Thanks again uh, to the Open Cellular presenters. Uh, presenters. Um,